Okay, our next talk is what I learned from a few million A-B tests. So A-B tests are one of the basic tools in the data scientist's toolbox. This talk is the sublimation of findings from running millions of simulated A-B tests and analyzing many real ones during the past eight years. Technology, art, and science converge together in the process of making games and data science in an increasingly bigger part of the process. Markov has been working in Nordius as a data scientist developing games for the past eight years. So this uh, talking presentation is about A-B tests and it will start soon. Hey everyone. First of all, it's an honor to join this conference. For today's topic, I've picked A-B tests. At one point, I wasn't really happy with all the learnings from the actual A-B tests I've done over the years, so I decided to do a few million of simulated ones, and today I'll be talking about both kinds. First of all, let me introduce myself. I started working in Nordius in 2012 in an analytics team that was one and a half men strong. Since then, I had this really interesting, amazing opportunity to grow professionally at the same time as data science grew as a field in gaming industry at large. Nordius was started in 2010 in an age of uh, in the golden age of Facebook games when it brought something completely new to the table, Top 11, which became the world's most successful mobile sports game. Now, uh, Nordius employs 180 people from across 20 countries and has since released Golden Boot and Heroic Magic Duel. So what's this talk about? Well, for one, it, not, it might be a good guide for someone entering data science from the machine learning background. And from my experience, this is the way most people enter data science these days. Machine learning will obviously uh, teach valuable skills, uh, valuable math skills and, and statistics. But there are some things in a day-to-day -day work of a product data scientist which are not covered by it. This is also a subject that's often been taken for granted. And as all things taken for granted, A-B tests have much more depth than it seems. And finally, this is my personal story about discovering my own professional weak spots. And here's the story. At one point, I decided I really want to know how T-test works. I wanted to understand it. And I started my search uh, at the place where most uh, searches start today at Google, went through many pages, and for most of them, I got something like the following. So you take your data after you've done the split and measured something, and the first thing you need to do is calculate T statistics. Then you need to figure out degrees of freedom, which is already a, a bit confusing uh, name, and you're using it to determine the exact student's distribution that you're going to use to translate your t-statistics into the p-value. And once you got it, if the p-value is less than 0.05, you can claim your hypothesis true or something like that. But if it's not less than 0.05, uh, you cannot claim it false. So it's already a bit confusing. But the most important thing is this wasn't really an answer to my question. I wanted to uh, understand how t-test works, to understand why the formulas are the way they are. Instead, I got a recipe, if you like, the list of things you do in order to, well, do the t-test. This is the confession part. I'm not a statistician. I've been trained in statistics, but uh, this feels to me like I'm reading someone else's code and they didn't have a good idea how to name the variables. The names aren't descriptive or intuitive, at least not to me. It feels very confusing. And frankly, for the most part of my career, I've followed the recipe. And you can learn a great deal from doing it. You can learn what to use and when and how to interpret the results. But in the end, uh, data science is about science, and science helps us to understand th things and uh, to help others understand. And in this case, I was using something I didn't fully understand to help 
others understand their data and their business and find new opportunities. And that was bothering me. It felt wrong. And it turns out it's not just my personal crisis. In recent years, top statisticians have challenged over-reliance on p-values and uh, pointed to their misuse in science and consequently in data science as well. And here is the excerpt from, uh, from a public statement from American Statistical Association. My two favorite points are p-values do not measure the probability the hypothesis is true, which is very common misconception. And p-value is not a substitute for reasoning. This one's very interesting because we often treat this p-value as something magical and we don't question it even though it goes against our common sense. So it's th this list has obviously a fair share of my own sins. But let's take a step back and look at how we do the measure. So you can imagine that uh, there is some underlying truth represented by this distribution that perfectly in the in the top image that perfectly describes how how we get the data points in the metric of, of interest. And then you do something. You decide to change the system somehow. You release new feature, uh, test new technology, or uh, test new drug. And we have uh, this goal to increase our metric of interest by 10%. This is represented at uh, the bottom image, where you can see this these two distributions look very close to each other. And this is true. Traditionally, this is considered a small effect size. Uh, but think about it for a second. If uh, you increased revenue by 10% in a multi-million business, this would be uh, additional million per year of usually clean profit. If you do this five times per year, you have literally transformed your business. But this is not how it usually works. We are very happy with much smaller increments, which means that uh, we are actually happy with something that's, uh, that's much smaller than what's traditionally considered small. Anyway, you, test, uh, you set up the test, do the 50-50 random split, and measure for some period of time, let's say seven, seven days, like in the examples here. And now you need to figure out uh, what's actually going on. Uh, do you have this change? Have you managed to improve something? Or you're just measuring the same thing in two different ways. And from these images, it looks like it's a trivial choice. If the red line is consistently above the blue line, then we obviously made some improvement. And if they're close, then, uh, well, probably we have failed but it's not that easy. And you can get the feel about this if you do a simple AA test. And AA test is exactly what it sounds like. You just do the split like you would in an AB test, but you don't change anything. And what you will typically get is two different measurements. Uh, and cool thing about this, you can actually use your existing data. You just randomly split it. So it's, it's cheap and you can do it anytime you want. But you can do the split in multiple ways. And let's say you do it in a uh, hundred different ways. You will get a hundred different pairs of measurements. And what you can do with these is you can print these images and give them to your colleagues. And then if you ask them, and especially if you frame the question in the following way, if you ask them uh, what version is better, you will get many wrong answers. And you will know they're wrong this time because you know what you did. So you don't have to stop at 100. You can do it many, many more times. Let's say you do it 100,000 times. And let's assume you have your criteria all straightened up. You will say something is better if it exceeds some predefined threshold. Let's say in this example, it's going to be 10%. And if you take these many, many repetitions uh, and uh, plot a histogram of differences, 
or let's be more specific, the mean differences, uh, you will get something that approximates better and better a distribution that looks like this, that looks like a normal distribution, but it's not. It's actually student's distribution, but already in this example, it's indistinguishable from, from the normal distribution. So if you did the whole thing as described, uh, and the example is uh, like uh, like I've I've described it, uh, out of hundred thousand repetitions, you will measure a difference that's greater than ten percent or lower than negative ten percent in about five thousand cases, which is zero point zero five, the magical number. So it's one in twenty. Okay, so now I have cheated a bit so far because uh, this is a good definition of a p-value. It's exactly what it does. It tells you uh, how many, uh, how often you can expect to measure something that seems uh, significant even though there is no underlying change. But this is not the way t-test works. You don't have this distribution. Uh, you only have your measurement. And I know that many data scientists prefer to do bootstrapping because it's much more visual and hence easier to communicate than t-test with its funny terminology. But there's also a confusion about uh, how to do the resampling for the bootstrapping. And here's the thing, you can actually connect the bootstrapping and t-test very easily. So uh, by definition, we, are measuring p-value assuming that everything comes from the same data source, that everything comes from the same distribution. So we will just assume all our data is coming from the same distribution, from both groups. So in this case, we had a thousand and a thousand samples. So uh, we just joined them into a pool of 2000 data points. And these 2000 data points will represent this underlying, uh, maybe imaginary distribution uh, that we are sampling from. So uh, each time we are resampling, we will just pick uh, samples from this pool. And how many samples is there? Well, the same amount there was in the, or in the original groups. So in this case, it's 1000 each. And then if you repeat this uh, many, many times, you will eventually approximate this distribution. And uh, the p-value for some difference is just the percent of repetitions uh, for which, uh, which produce the higher difference than, than the set threshold. Now, it won't tell you more than this. Just if you're seeing this difference, there's, let's say, 3% chance that this was a uh, lucky or unlucky if you if you look at it that way unlucky draw and uh, you're still making a bet on it so it doesn't tell you anything definite this is very important p-value helps you make smarter bets it doesn't tell you anything about the truth but p-value is not the whole story it should be obvious that depending on your measurement uh, you can get a very low p-value that doesn't mean much without the context. And the context is how the test was designed. What's the alpha cutoff uh, and what's the statistical power? And these are another two weird variable names. Alpha cutoff is just the name for the magical 0 0.05. And statistical power is uh, this other parameter that you're usually leaving at the default value when you need to figure out what's the minimum sample size you need to, to run the experiment. And uh, here's a funny trick. You can treat t-test as a pre-trained classifier. And why not? It just makes binary decision. So you can draw uh, a confusion matrix, which most of you from coming from machine learning already recognized. And in this confusion matrix, you can easily see that 0 0.05 is alpha cutoff is actually false positive rate. 
and statistical power, which is usually 0 0.8, uh, is the true positive rate. Okay, now, uh, here's an interesting question you can ask yourself. How often will I be wrong? And if you rejected the null hypothesis, uh, which means you went with the alternative, turns out the p-value is not the probability you're wrong. Not even alpha cutoff is the probability you're wrong. So if you decided to reject the null hypothesis, your error is actually closer to 6%, and you can easily calculate it from this confusion matrix. But if you didn't reject the null hypothesis, your error rate in the default settings is close to 17%. And in this case, this is probably 17% of missed opportunities. So just think about it. Uh, you have missed a lot, of, a lot of opportunities to improve your business. And why is that? Because you went with the default values uh, that have been set up a hundred years ago. And that's all to it. They didn't have computers back then. They didn't have the means to collect the data that uh, we do have today. So why would you stick to these default values in the first place? We can go a step further and even draw a rock curve for a given t-test. So why not if, if it's a classifier? And same as when you're building a classifier, you need to ask yourself, what will hurt you more, false positive or missed opportunity? And again, same as when building a machine learning classifier, you're finding the answer in uh, discussing it with your stakeholders. This will help position the dot on the rock curve to something more favorable for your business. But think about it. If this was a Kaggle competition, would you be satisfied if you knew you could get much better performance overall? Again, the question is, what's your company's strategy about A-B tests? If you're doing them rarely, uh, well, you could improve performance of these tests a lot by just increasing the sample sizes by 50%. And uh, maybe you want to optimize for quantity, you want to do a lot, a lot of uh, automated A-B tests. In that case, again, you need to have this conversation, but be aware of the trade-offs and then decide. You don't need to use the default values. Okay, so far I've been talking about uh, some, some things that are mostly familiar. Here's something new, at least it was to me. And yes, I'm not a statistician again, but I would expect that I got familiar with these concepts uh, somewhat earlier, considering what I do for LIM. Let me start the, the story from, uh, from a paper I read uh, where they have found in uh, Airbnb that uh, A-B tests often overpromise compared to uh, the actual increases to the baseline. And this is a big company with a huge amount of data and, and uh, they can measure this effectively. Okay, they had a lot of explanations. Uh, why, is, why is that so? Uh, obviously there is no uh, single reason why this happens, but it turns out that M error is certainly uh, one of the puzzle pieces of, of this confusion. So what is an M error? It's magnitude error and it's very interesting thing so it's it's going to tell us uh how much we can expect to overestimate uh when we make an estimate of how much we have increased something so it only kicks in if uh we have rejected the null hypothesis the easiest way to explain it is uh, by observing uh, uh, edge cases on, on uh, two different, different ends of a spectrum. So let's say uh, we are looking for a change of 10%. And the actual change is much higher. It's around 
So what we are going to measure, we are going to measure something around this 50%. And with more or less equal probability, we can measure a bit more than 50% or a bit less than 50%. But uh, overall, our uh, expected error is close to zero. But if the actual change is 10%, well, then we either, either measure 10% or higher, in which case uh, we have almost certainly overestimated the true effect, or we will measure something less than 10%, in which case we have actually false negative. We have concluded that the change is not significant. So the first thing is that although M error can be defined overall as the average error across all possible outcomes like these, uh, it kicks in uh, to much higher degree if you're measuring something close to your decision boundary. And here's the main issue with, with uh, how we're running A-B tests. So often if we have a target of let's say 10% uh, increase, uh, we set this or something very close to this number as a decision criteria. And this is obviously wrong because if we do manage to measure something uh, we will most cer certainly get an inflated number. Good thing is that uh, it, can be, it can be influenced by increasing the power of the test by increasing sample sizes. And in these images, you can see how it, how it varies and how quickly it drops when you're increasing sample sizes. But you can also see that if you're uh, stopping your test too early, you're going just to make this problem even worse. So if you do measure something that looks uh, significant, it's most probably overestimating the true effects. And uh, obviously this is one of the very important reasons why uh, A-B tests seem to overpromise. Another new thing is S error or sign error. And uh, it's actually the worst kind of error that can happen to you when you're doing A-B tests. It happens when you decide there's a change, but you thought it's a positive change and instead it's a actually negative change. Luckily, it's mostly benign. If you're not using a serious, seriously underpowered test, if you're at least using default values, uh, the probability is really, really small. Again, it's higher near the decision boundary. And it drops really quickly with statistical power, with the increase of the statistical power. Okay, this whole talk would be incomplete if I haven't touched the problem of measuring revenue and more specifically revenue in free-to-play games because this is what's bothering me day to day. So revenue can be nicely modeled by Pareto distribution or some other skewed distribution. Um, something that tells us that 20% of customers brings us 80% of the revenue or 20% of our inventory is bringing 80% of the revenue or something similar to it. So in free-to-play games, only a fraction of players are customers, and this rule still applies to our customers. So the final distribution of average revenue per uh, player is heavily, heavily skewed. And the question is always what to do with this data. So you can often find in literature that uh, uh, t-test is only used for normal distributions. Well, this is not true. Others say uh, it's asymptotically correct uh, if distribution of means is normally distributed. And this is a lot to take, really. You need to figure out what it means. But the truth is the t-test is incredibly robust and you can use it to test almost any kind of data. I've run simulated experiments with uniform, normal, exponential, and some very skewed distributions that look like our, um, our distributions for, for revenue in free-to-play games. And uh, it has very similar performance on all of them when they have fixed, fixed variations. Actually, uh, it works even better on heavily skewed distributions. 
And I'm not really sure why is that, but I can assume that there is simply more mass under this peak that you can see on the image below. Of course, it's still very, very hard to test uh, these metrics because uh, their variation is huge and that's creating a lot of problems. But the good news is that you can freely use uh, you can freely use t-test, or you can test maybe uh, some of the other suggestions like transforming the data, trimming outliers, or maybe some different tests. But it's very useful to test them on the simulated simulated data on the simulated examples because that's really the only way you're going to uh, know exactly what happens. Here are the main points of this talk. So first of all, p-value is confusing. Just accept it. It's not telling us any of the things we wish it did. It's there just to help us make better bets. So accept the uncertainty. And yes, bootstrapping is your friend. It can help you visualize the results better and hence communicate them better. But in its essence, it's not doing anything much more different from t-test. So you can always run t-test in parallel. And if bootstrapping is giving you much better or uh, consequently much worse results, uh, it's a smart thing to recheck your code. Maybe the most important takeaway from this talk is uh, to ask the question, what does your business need? So stop using defaults for a second and think about what errors pain your business. Have a discussion about it. And to help in this discussion, you can always treat t-test as a machine learning classifier and use all the tricks to improve the performance that you know from, from this area. For me personally, uh, my biggest lesson was the discovery of mTool. So I've only recently learned something new about an algorithm that's in literally every statistics textbook out there. So yes, I did learn why A-B tests sometimes overpromise or uh, how to design them better and have better conversations. But it also made me wonder how deep is the rabbit hole. It was certainly a lesson in humility. And most important thing is if you're going to bother with doing A-B tests at all, spend additional time maybe apply some of these things and uh, surely you will get more in return from from a b tests to, to help you in this i've compiled a short list of uh, tips and best practices from my own experience from the literature and other people's experience as well so the first thing is rule of extraordinary it says that the changes rarely produce big positive impact and if you're working on a live product, you have certainly recognized this. If you see extraordinary result, well, demand extraordinary proof. Be cautious about it. This is especially true about the outside, outside of your company results. So what often happens is that another company uh, publishes a result which is amazing. And it can easily happen that if you implement the same thing they did, you will not get this amazing result. The reasons can be multiple. One of them is, well, maybe they just had a big problem that you don't have. So it's really not, uh, not realistic to expect the same improvement they got. Another thing could be they have just fallen in some of the traps I was talking about and then just overestimated the impact they have made. Don't stop the experiments early. Just don't do it, really. I've talked a lot about what happens when you're using underpowered experiments, and this is just when they have been randomly shortened. But if you have stopped them precisely because you saw a good result, like a p-value that's less than 0 0.05, then all the problems are that much greater. Just don't do it or be very, very cautious about it. Another common pitfall is to release many changes on a live product and then measure it against the previous version. 
And this can really uh, make analysis difficult once we get the data from A-B test. It's a smart thing to start with the end in mind and think about how we would interpret the results. And in case of A-B test, it's not that difficult because they have only a few, few possible outcomes. So thinking about how we would make decisions based on these different outcomes is certainly a good starting point for making better A-B tests. Rule of thumb is obviously to have simpler changes that will be easier to interpret in the end. Recheck assumptions. If something unexpectedly has unexpected has happened during the uh, during the period where you ran the test, it's a smart thing to to just go back and recheck if the test has still the statistical power you need. And here's a very neat trick uh, from my personal experience. So the thing we often want to do is to drive the player's behavior somehow. So let's say we uh, want to release a feature and we expect to improve player's retention. If we just test the player's retention, we might not learn anything, even if the result is positive, but especially if it's negative. So we don't know what to improve. So a very good uh, practice is to have additional metric that's going to help us decide if the design was good. It can be something very simple, like checking if players are interacting with the feature at all, or if they're interacting with the feature in the way we expected them to. So if this is not true, then it's really foolish to expect that retention is going to improve. But if they are interacting with the feature the way we want it, well, that might mean it's not actually improving their experience that much in the game. And hence, it's a false assumption from our side. It's, it's just not, not increasing retention. And we might abandon the idea altogether instead of trying to, to improve it somehow. So the last thing is maybe a bit strange uh, coming in a talk about A-B test, but don't test everything. Uh, if you do this, you will obviously slow down in the development and this can burn a lot of money and in the end even burn the people. So uh, be very thoughtful about tests. If you're doing a lot of them, uh, make them automatic tests that are just going to optimize a lot of parameters of your business. Or again, be very thoughtful and do a few of them that will help you learn some important things, maybe even things that you could generalize across your business. Thank you for your time.